What are the root causes of modern day slavery? A report says some 50 million people are victims of exploitation by others, and the situation is getting worse. So, what's being done to stop it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The numbers are staggering. An estimated 50 million people around the world living in modern-day slavery as recently as 2021. A report by the international rights group Walk Free suggests the figure increased by 10 million within five years. The reasons are complex, but extreme weather conditions, forced migration, and armed conflicts are exposing entire communities to exploitation. Low-income countries are at the center of this issue, but findings show consumerism and demands from rich nations are contributing to the problem. We'll ask our guests shortly about what can be done to combat this. First, let's take a closer look at the report. Researchers found forced labor is among the most prevalent forms of modern slavery. Also high on the list is forced marriage, which affects about 12 million children, mostly girls, every year. The report says the biggest offenders of modern slavery are North Korea, Eritrea, and Mauritania. They're followed by Saudi Arabia and Turkey. India has the highest number of people, about 11 million, living in modern-day slavery. It's followed by China, which has roughly 6 million. Findings show huge consumerism in rich countries is worsening the problem. More than $460 billion worth of goods were imported by G20 countries in 2021, and some of the industries use modern-day slavery as part of their production line. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. In London, Sophie Otiende, CEO of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery and a survivor of human trafficking. In Bangkok, Phil Robertson, the deputy director of the Asia Division at Human Rights Watch. And also in London, Grace Forrest, founding director of Walk Free, the rights group that published the Modern Slavery Report. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Grace, let me start with you today. How is modern-day slavery defined, and what are its root causes? We define modern slavery as the systemic removal of a person's freedom, where one person is exploited by another for personal or financial gain. It's an umbrella term that encompasses a number of highly exploitative practices, including forced labour, forced marriage, debt bondage, human trafficking and state-imposed forced labour. The fact that we're looking at 50 million people living in modern slavery in the world today is truly shocking. A 10 million person increase in the last five years. And we put this increase down to compounding crises throughout the world, from the COVID-19 pandemic to the climate crisis to protracted conflict. But modern slavery is not a new problem. Modern slavery is connected to historical inequality and to deep social inequity, which I'm sure my colleague Sophie Otiende can talk far more about. Sophie, let me ask you, when it comes to the methodology involved in collecting this data, do you feel that communities that have been impacted by modern slavery have been centered in the conversation about these issues up until this point? Uh, thank you so much, Mohammed. I think for this particular, I'll speak about this particular report. Yes, they've been centered. I think one of the things that is truly a good practice, and I would commend the Walk Free team in collecting this information. What they did is really work with survivor leaders on the ground to form what we call lived expert groups who are able to feed information and really talk about what their, their experiences are and also, like, give recommendation. For me, that's the most important thing. Historically, when survivor leaders and impacted communities have been brought into conversations, the discussion has always been telling their stories and re regurgitating trauma. But for this particular report, I think what the practice in general was actually giving recommendation, which is, I think, uh, speaks to the quality of this report this time. Phil, um, one of the countries mentioned very prominently in this report, uh, in the Global Serv uh, Slavery Index, it lists North Korea as having the highest prevalence of modern slavery in the world. Human Rights Watch has reported in the past that Pyongyang uses predatory labor abuses to build its economy. Um, in the past, when Human Rights Watch has reported on this issue, what have some of your findings been? 
Well, forced labor is used a, a systematic and pervasive practice in North Korea. It is used not only to construct everything from infrastructure to ski resorts, but it's also used as a form of punishment that uh, people who uh, run afoul of the regime end up in uh, forced labor camps. Um, in some cases, uh, they end up in camps like the Guanliso, which for political prisoners is a place where people are worked to death. So it, it is a part of the core, core sort of practice of North Korea to demand forced labor from their people. And, uh, you know, they've now made it as a result of the, the changes that took place during the COVID pandemic, they've made it much more difficult for people to escape. So now we have a, you know, a northern border with China that has barbed wire and armed guards. So, you know, it's a forced labor gulag uh, with guards that shoot to kill if you try to escape. Grace, I saw you nodding along to a lot of what Phil was saying there, so I'm going to give you a chance to jump in. But I also want to ask you about some of the other countries mentioned in the report. Uh, among the 10 countries with the highest prevalence of modern slavery in your reporting are Eritrea, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, of course, other countries as well. Do those countries and the other countries that have listed have common characteristics? And if so, what are some of them? They absolutely do have common characteristics. We're looking at a number of authoritarian regimes where entire social groups are excluded from social plans altogether, and equally where systems are built off structural inequality. So for the first time, we have three Arab states in the top ten, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the UAE. And this is largely due to systems like kafala, where migrant workers are being exploited in their hundreds of thousands, underpinning their economies in all ways. But when it comes to countries like Eritrea and North Korea, we are looking at widespread state-imposed forced labour. And this is really concerning. They're actually two of 17 countries experiencing state-imposed forced labour throughout the world, including um, countries such as the United States. But I think what's important when we talk about state-imposed forced labour is that we understand that this is happening at the hands of governments and it is happening often to ethnic minorities and is connected to supply chains of the goods we buy and use every single day. So when we look at the products of the highest import risk, be it garments connected to cotton or solar panels connected to polysilica, both of these areas link back to Xinjiang in China, where state-imposed forced labour is occurring. Uh, Grace, I also want to just uh, follow up with you and dig down a little bit deeper into the, the number. I mean, the report says an estimated 50 million people around the world have been living in modern-day slavery as recently as 2021, and that there has been an increase mm -hmm. um, of 10 million since 2018, I believe, was the last report. Does that suggest that there are 10 million more people now that are living in modern slavery conditions, or is it that the methodology has changed and that you were able to identify more people that are living in those conditions, that have been living in those conditions prior to 2021. Yes, so the answer is both. The methodology has become stronger, and this is without a doubt the most rigorous report we've ever put out, but I can unequivocally say this is a comparative estimate. It is an increase of people living in modern slavery, and the fact that governments a few governments have implemented legislation to combat modern slavery, and yet the issue has gotten worse, is a major problem. The fact is we're looking at increasing vulnerability and diminishing political will. And for many countries in the G20, it's important to note that they do not have adequate legislation to prevent to modern slavery or to respond to protect survivors. Criminal justice systems in some of, in some of these countries re-traumatise and re-traffic people in modern slavery. And I think something that is really important to note about these new findings of 50 million people is that over 50% of that figure are people experiencing modern slavery in G20 countries. And on top of this, G20 countries have half a trillion dollar import risk. Uh, Sophie, I, I saw you nodding along uh, to what Grace was saying there. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I definitely. I, I just wanted to to agree with Grace in terms of the numbers and the increase. So when you think about all the issues that we've gone through the past three, four years, if you're talking about COVID-19, you are talking about the humanitarian crisis that is going around the world. This has led to, of course, increased vulnerability, and essentially that number is reflected in the increase that we are seeing. And as you are saying, there are all these multiple crises is going on, and this is just one of them. And we need to think about how we deal with these things 
together as a solution to addressing, you know, pressing issues that are affecting humanity, rather than siloed, where everyone is working on a very specific issue, which is sort of what, I, what happens when we're talking about climate change. We're just talking about climate change. When we're talking about war in Ukraine, we're only talking about war, war in Ukraine. But when you think about it, all these issues are affecting the same, same groups of people. Therefore, we, we really need to start coming together and actually thinking about how we come up with solutions that address these things together, because we have fewer and fewer resources to actually do that. Sophie, I I've heard you say in the past that the numbers don't capture the individual stories enough of the people impacted by modern slavery. I mean, when you're talking about 50 million people, that number is staggering. That number is horrific. But I'm curious, from your point of view, how difficult is it um, for people to really understand the conditions that so many people in the world are living in, people that aren't confronted with this reality day by day, how difficult is it to reach them when it comes to making them understand how many vulnerable populations there are out there in the world? I think, again, we go back to when I say this is, the numbers basically just say, okay, these are, numbers are really important because it's really hard for, for people to understand something if you don't say how, how big the issue is. So I definitely think numbers help in compartmentalizing that issue. But yes, when you think about what I say this, when you think about modern slavery, it's the story of a young girl who is stuck in a house somewhere in Ethiopia or somewhere in Nairobi, who's being abused by their, their relative. It's a migrant worker in a, in, a, in a farm. So it's multiple forms of abuse happening to a person. And sometimes it's not it's the same person facing different forms of abuses. I think sometimes when we talk about it, and especially when we look at numbers, people assume that, you know, this person is just going through this one abuse. The reality is that you'll find that the same girl that is trafficked for domestic work will be sexually abused in the house. That same person will be the same person that, you know, does not have documents to identify them. So when you think about vulnerabilities, just thinking that this is something that basically affects uh, a very specific group of people. Uh, I think Grace in the report says that, you know, this, whatever is happening, is happening by design, and we really need to question how we've structured our system as, you know, as humanity, so that there are specific groups of people that tend to be experiencing the same thing. So it's the same, same groups that are being affected by all these different issues. So it, the, the inequality is by design, it's not by mistake. Phil, I realize this is a bit of a broad question, but when it comes to the Asian countries that are tackling these issues, by and large, how have they done, how are they doing, and, and are governments in Asia doing more to combat impunity when it comes to uh, abuses against laborers? Well, I think one of the big problems uh, are the hidden dimensions of forced labor amongst migrant workers in the region, and also amongst migrant workers who are leaving the region, going to places like the Middle East. Um, what we see is there is not any sort of system of effective regulation or uh, laws that uh, empower migrants to basically represent themselves, to organize unions, to be able to protect themselves. Um, instead, we see systems that are all about control about giving power to employers over migrant workers and then failing to uh, intervene when we see, for instance, abuses against migrant domestic workers, uh, including beatings and sexual abuse and non-payment of wages. When we see, uh, you know, persons in debt bondage in places like Malaysia, uh, you know, entire factories from people from South Asia who can't uh, return home and can't get paid the what they were promised. Or, you know, the sorts of uh, uh, forced labor on fishing boats, you know, which has been entirely a hidden, hidden problem. That is one of the big issues. I mean, I think it is very important that we found, you know, for instance, systematic forced labor in places like Xinjiang, you know, what is being done to the Uyghurs and the, and the Turkic minorities by the, by the state in China uh, and what has been done in North Korea, as we already mentioned. But, you know, there, there's a whole dimension of, of migration.
that is simply not being uh, addressed by the government. So few of them uh, protect migrant workers. So few of them have ratified the Convention on Migrant Workers or the relevant ILO conventions. And so few of them have put in any sort of sy systematic uh, regulation or laws to protect migrant workers and, and do uh, the kind of work that is needed to help migrant workers when they go overseas. And, Phil, you know, when we've spoken in the past, we've often spoken about these migration issues, especially when it comes to refugees. Let's take, for example, a topic you and I have spoken about many times before, which is refugees uh, fleeing Myanmar, fleeing what's going on in Myanmar, yes. particularly the Rohingya. I want to ask you just how vulnerable are these populations, the fact that they are fleeing war, the fact that they are refugees, how easy is it for them to be drawn into these circumstances, whether it be forced labor or whether it just be more in general modern slavery conditions? Well, unfortunately, it's it's rather easy. I mean, and what we see, for instance, in the very large number of uh, Rohingya in Saudi Arabia uh, and also in Malaysia is that these people don't have documents. Uh, they don't have protections. Uh, they are operating on the margins of society. They're very easy to exploit. Uh, they're easy to force uh, into labor. Um, you have issues of child marriage. You have issues of uh, forced marriage. Uh, you know, the, it goes on and on. And, and, and it's connected to the vulnerability of the Rohingya as stateless persons and also people coming, uh, you know, fleeing uh, acts of genocide and crimes against humanity in Myanmar. So there's nowhere uh, that there's no country that wants to protect them because Myanmar doesn't view them as being from Myanmar. Uh, Sophie, I saw you nodding along to a lot of what Phil was saying there. Uh, I want to ask you first about um, when he was talking about forced marriage, uh, how, how big of an issue is it? How big of a component is this when it comes to modern slavery? And, and how many people are we talking about? I, I just wanted to uh, basically echo what Phil said, that when you have a group of people who are marginalized as a result of the system not protecting them, because we need to demand for governments to actually protect people, either if it's identity documents allowing them to organize social protection systems, which we see existing for certain groups of people and not necessarily certain groups of people. I think the thing about forced marriage that I thought was interesting was also the fact that when we talk about forced marriage, most people think that forced marriage pre predominantly exists in certain countries. We see in this report that was not the case, that the numbers are not just in one part of the, of, of the globe that we think, that the numbers are spread rather than what we've predominantly thought. Uh, Grace, so, so let me go ahead and ask you then, when it comes to the issue of forced marriage, uh, what kind of numbers are we talking about? How big of, of a component is this in the reporting that you all have done? It's a very big component. We're talking about 22 million people. And I think it's very dangerous for people to ever think of forced marriage as separate to other forms of modern slavery. When someone is forced into a situation of labour, that time could be for five days, two weeks, five months or a number of years. But a sentence to a forced marriage is a life sentence. It's often happening to minors and people who are being commodified. And I think what's essential in understanding the increase in forced marriage throughout the world in the last five years is that it's happening on the backdrop of women's rights being rolled back globally. From the United States to Afghanistan, we are seeing major issues on women's rights not being documented, not being seen as critical to sustainable development. And to further that, in times of crisis, often the first thing to be taken off the table is the rights of women and girls. We saw this in the COVID-19 pandemic when Somalia looked to re-legalise child marriage for children as young as eight years old as a direct result of the economic volatility felt by the pandemic. If you come down to my region of the world, in Indonesia, there was a 50% increase in applications for child marriages as opposed to in 2012. This is not a coincidence. As Sophie so importantly said, modern slavery is not an issue that happens in isolation. It is a deeply gendered issue. It is an issue of racial injustice. It is an issue of not valuing migrant workers who are an essential part of our economies. And migrant workers who sometimes travel the seas for work also end up in forced marriage. And as Sophie said, forced marriages are being experienced in every region of the world, cutting across ethnic, cultural and religious lines. We've seen forced marriage cases in Australia, certainly many forced marriage cases in the United States. And 
It's obviously no surprise to people where forced marriages occur in times of conflict and crisis as a result of economic volatility. Too easily is it blamed on cultural custom or that's how things are done here. Ask the women in that society and they'll often tell you something different. But I think it's important that we piece together the rights of women and girls in the times of crisis and understand that unless their rights are embedded in law and valued by cultural custom, they are not a given. Phil, oftentimes when reports of this nature come out and shock a large group of people, there are governments that will start trying to change their laws. And there are governments that have tried to change their laws when it comes to modern slavery practices in the past several years. From your vantage point, though, are these types of laws actually implemented? Well, that's a big problem, isn't it? I mean, you have uh, the effort to uh, pass laws, and we saw this actually, you know, really when human trafficking became an issue back in the early two, 2000s. But, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, the implementation was lacking. And that continues to be a major problem in the, in the region I work in, in Southeast Asia, where we see time and time again uh, laws that are uh, passed or regulations that are put in uh, that there's no effective... Uh, uh, implementation. Uh, uh, for instance, like if we look at Thailand, Thailand, you know, is, is is held up as a positive example in this report, but they've they've criminalized forced labor uh, resulting from the uh, of the push on uh, human trafficking on fishing boats and the forced labor on fishing boats, but it's not effectively enforced. Uh, you know, the the laws on the books, but you know the police aren't trained, the uh, local officials don't understand it. And as a result, uh, it's sort of sitting on a shelf. There's just not the kind of implementation that needs it to, to address the kinds of forced labor that we see day in and day out across Thailand. Uh, Sophie, let me ask you a version of the same question. I mean, do, do you see, from your vantage point, governments that have actually changed their laws to try to end these practices, are they actually doing enough to implement these laws? Is anything changing on the ground? And, and also, let me ask you, from your perspective, is there a willingness to actually confront the root causes of slavery? Again, we go back to, yeah, it's, I, I would agree with, with Phil completely that when this issue came up, one of the things that happened is people quickly rushed to, you know, to set up new laws. And again, if you think about this issue as an intersectional issue, as an issue that affects women, women and girls, as an issue that affects migrant workers, if we don't bring all those policies together, we can't have increased f freedom for those people. So even if we have while I absolutely advocate for strong measures when it comes to, you know, policy around modern slavery, but the truth is it's not effective on the ground if that policy is not tied with, you know, the policy ab around, you know, women and girls. It's not tied around policies around education. It's not tied around policies around access to, let's say, land. You know, it's really hard for this issue to be dealt within a siloed way. So that means that at implementation level, whatever someone is experiencing is very different because we c it's not practical sometimes to separate it. That said, I think one of the things that is really important about this report is it's also given like a framework that you know, activists and people who are working on the ground can start using to hold governments accountable for some of the things that can be put down in place practically. We need to start somewhere. And I think that's one, by finding the language around this, and, you know, the report gives that. And two, by saying, what is the bare minimum that a government should be able to do for these groups and how can we be able to hold them accountable? And I feel like sometimes that's, that's what is missing. The fact that most policy is made at a really top level and implementation needs happens with people who don't have information on what the policy is or how to implement it. And I think that can improve, but it's not a one-man job. We need to have everyone and different groups working together to be able to achieve that. Grace, the report calls on governments around the world to immediately take five key actions. What are those actions? 
Those actions are to implement and create stronger laws on addressing forced labour in the private and public economy, so forced labour in supply chains and forced labour happening at the hands of the state. Part of this is in relation to how we trade with other countries. I think Sophie said it best, modern slavery cannot be addressed in isolation. And countries creating laws specific to modern slavery or human trafficking, it's a start. But one of our steps is to integrate modern slavery responses into humanitarian responses, into how we deal with crises. Responses that are already created, they need a modern slavery lens. Then we look at the green economy, which by default will be built on forced labour right now if we do not implement transparency and accountability, human rights due diligence laws across these supply chains. From supply, from solar panels rather, to batteries in electric vehicles, we know that this vulnerability is massive. Equally, we need to ensure that civil rights are being felt by people throughout the world and migration systems are clearly fractured, as Phil spoke to. We are looking at migrant workforces in their millions, crossing the sea, coming to work in countries throughout the world. They are a fundamental and important part of our economy and it's time that they're treated with the basic human rights and respect that they deserve. Tied visa systems from Australia to Singapore to Saudi Arabia are deeply problematic for creating cycles of exploitation. Lastly, we need to address laws that actually create further vulnerability to modern slavery, such as addressing legal marriage age. Lifting the legal marriage age to 18 is a really mm -hmm. simple step that countries can take. Lastly, when engaging mm -hmm. with repressive regimes, which of course many governments do throughout the mm -hmm. world through trade, we need to centre these conversations on human rights and transparency, especially when it comes to state-imposed forced labour. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there today. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Sophie Otiende, Phil Robertson, and Grace Forrest. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the entire team here, bye for now.